Hi, I'm Dr. Baxter Bell, and welcome to this Yoga U Online tutorial on Triangle Pose. So today I'm going to take you through some of the nuances and subtleties of a very common modern yoga pose called triangle pose. Uh, in Sanskrit we call this pose Utita Trikonasana. And when you get into the pose, as you'll see in a little while, the body forms a whole series of triangular shapes between the legs, between the arms and the body. And so, <clears throat> therefore, we've come to call this triangle pose in our modern yoga practice. Triangle pose has benefits uh, in doing it regularly, and we'll talk a little bit about those benefits as they arise. And there are also some challenges to, to the triangle pose, some areas of the body that might struggle with this particular pose as well. In addition, um, there are also some areas you have, to, you, you have to be careful with. So if you have certain things going on in your body, you might have to be more mindful of how you're doing your triangle pose so as to not overdo those areas of the body. For example, <clears throat> a lot of my students, I have a back care class that I teach regularly in my hometown of Oakland, California, and a lot of the folks with lower back problems find that the triangle pose shape will often aggravate their lower back uh, symptoms. So for some groups of people, You'll want to be mindful of how you do the pose, and I'll try to bring some attention to that um, as we get into some of the different variations of triangle pose. So I'm going to try to break it down into stages so that at each stage of the way into triangle pose and out of triangle pose, you are going to get really clear on what's happening in the body and what areas have to be adept in order to get in and out of the body, what areas have to be stretched and open, what areas have to be engaged and strong, so that you have a much clearer understanding of triangle pose by the time we finish our time together. So triangle pose is one of the standing poses of our modern yoga practice. And in this particular uh, standing pose, we typically take the legs from the mountain pose position, where the feet are very even on the inner and outer edge of the feet, and we step the feet apart. There's a lot of variability in how far the feet are, are suggested uh, to be moved apart in this pose. Um, a couple of the different things that I've been taught over the years are somewhere between four and four and a half feet wide. But as you can imagine, that's going to depend a little bit on how tall someone is and how long their legs are. <clears throat> Another little uh, way to, to measure the foot distance is to take the arms out to the sides and notice where your wrists are and position the edges of your feet over the wrists. So sometimes you might have to have a reflective surface in front of you, like a mirror or a set of sliding glass doors that you can actually look at at home to see about the distance of the feet. Uh, so however you get it, and some of it's also going to depend on how tight the inner thighs are. So if you have really tight inner thighs, you might have to start with the feet closer together and gradually, over time, take the feet farther apart. So give yourself that freedom to play ar around a little bit with how far the fe feet are apart in triangle pose. The next factor that's really important uh, that comes into play in getting into any of these standing poses is how you adjust your feet. I'm fairly particular about this because how you get your feet into position affects your balance <clears throat> in these poses. So if you just move your feet around with a lot, without a lot of mindfulness, the feet can be aligned in very weird ways, one with the other, and this can affect your, your overall balance. So for instance, when I'm turning my right foot out, I see a lot of my students do the following. They'll turn the heel in, then the foot out, then the heel, and then the foot out, and pretty soon they don't know exactly where that foot is relative to the other foot. So instead, I like to be very particular and I like to spin on the heel pad, the back part of the foot, and get that foot to turn out. Now it's important that when my foot turns out 90 degrees, so it's pointing directly that way, 90 degrees from the forward position, that I check in with my leg as well. A lot of times the hip could still be turned internally like this instead of turning out a little bit. And when the thigh turns out, the hips usually follow a little bit. So I like to let that action happen because it allows my lower back to stay very even on a diagonal and so the joints at the back of the pelvis are healthier. So once I've got my front foot turned out, I check to see if my knee is lining up with my middle toe, which is a pretty good indicator of my thigh turning out as well, then I can address my back foot. Now in real time in class you're going to do this much faster. We're just breaking it down so it's very clear for you today. 
The back foot, in some traditions, they'll have you stick your butt back a little bit, turn the foot in, and then bring the hips back in. But to me, that is a wobble, which is very unstable, and I found very easily that if I pivot on the ball of my big toe and kick my back heel back an inch, just like that, that little maneuver there, I'll do it again, I'll bring it back to where I started. I lift the heel up, push it back, and set it down. Then my back foot ends up turning slightly in this way, which allows my hips to turn a little bit, and then I can activate the feet. Now everybody's body's a little different. Some of you might have to keep the foot more at 90 degrees. Some of you can come in to maybe 75 degrees. Some of you could turn in even a little bit more and it'll feel okay for your ankle, your knee, and your hip. So play around with that a little bit. The next action, I'm gonna not talk about the arms so much right now, but I wanna talk about the hips because this is where there's a lot of different ideas out there about how to do the hips. And honestly, no one way works for everybody. But this is the way I found it's been most healthy for most of my students and for my body. So instead of the hips squaring with the long edge of your mat like I'm doing right now, which tends to roll my front thigh in and stress my inner front knee and jam my front ankle, I'm gonna let those hips have that little rotation. I imagine that my hips are like a, a sundial turning about an hour or two toward my right leg. And then from here, I'm gonna break it down. The hips are gonna shift back a little bit but I'm not gonna drop aggressively down and into this back hamstring because that's gonna stress the hamstring and possibly jam the hip. I'm simply gonna lift, in fact I like to think about my hips lifting off my leg bones and then as my hips tip as a unit, I'm gonna represent the hips with my hands, as my hips tip a little bit with the unit, they still have this slight rotation forward. So once I get my hips into, and I've, I've tipped to the point where my front hamstring is saying, that's as far as you can safely go right now. So if my hand were just on my leg, it would be to about here. From here then, I'm gonna keep this orientation of my pelvis on this slight angle this way. So I'm not doing this with my hips, but I'm doing this with the hips. The chest is gonna turn slightly skyward, and the top arm now can come up. We'll come back to the arms in a minute. All right, so that's the, the hip action. When I come out, I really keep that same diagonal orientation of the hips and I untip the hips, so I bring them back up, and then as I turn my feet, I turn the hips at the same time. So everything's kind of coordinated as a team in the hip area. Let's see what that looks like to the left side. So I check my big toes, they're lined up with one another and the front edge of my mat. I'm pivoting on the heel of the front foot turning it out 90 degrees. I'm checking to make sure that my thigh has also turned out. So sometimes I'll actually take the hand to the root of the thigh and turn it out a little bit more. So now my kneecap, as I look from this angle, you can't see it from your angle, but I'm looking down and I see my kneecap is in line with my second and third toe. Then I go to the back foot. I lift the heel up a little bit. I swing the heel back about an inch and set it back down. As I do that, that might settle me into that turn of the hips a little bit more. In this moment, my back hip is higher than my front hip, and that is okay in my book. In, in the book of Baxter Bell Yoga, that's okay. Other folks might have other ideas on that, but I think that's all right. In fact, it allows the hips to kind of drop in to the hip joints on both sides in a, in a relatively good way. And then from that slight diagonal rotation of the hips, I'm then gonna let the hips slide back a little bit, just the right amount of tension in the back of that left hamstring, and then I'm gonna find out when I get that signal from my front hamstring that it doesn't really wanna bend or stretch any more deeply, then my hand comes to the leg or a block or a chair. And we'll look at some variations for the hands in a moment. And then to come out, I reverse that action. So the hips tip up and out, and as my feet turn, my hips turn back to center, and then to come out, I bring my feet back together, and I come to mountain pose. So a little bit about what's happening in the feet and the knees. Now, about the quality of the muscles in the legs. Let me go back to the second side one more time. So front foot turns out, back heel kicks in. So the more you practice this, the easier these transitions get and you don't have to spend a lot of conscious mental energy on it and you can get into the more subtle aspects of the pose. So I tip my hips, I come into it. Still not talking much about the arms yet. Once I'm here, I could just hang with my torso, my, my pelvis kind of into the legs, but that tends to kind of overstretch and jam certain areas. So I think about the energy from my feet drawing up through the leg bones towards the hips. This is imagery. It has different ways of being described by different folks. But another way I think about it is if I was pulling on a really tight pair of jeans that were too small for me, and I would feel that snug feeling of the fabric against my legs, I want my bones to feel that way. I mean. Um, <clears throat> 
my muscles to feel that way against my bones, right? So if I'm in my leg position and I'm tipped in, at that moment I pull on my tight jeans to activate the muscular groups in the legs to support the lift of my spine. The spine is what I want to talk about next. So as I've tipped to the side, I want to be mindful of the spine. If it was the right and left side of the spine represented by my arms, the right and left side of the spine stays relatively parallel. Now the tendency is that students get excited when they see a teacher with their hand on the floor and they think, oh, that's what I should do with my body. And so they take that hand down and I'll do it because I'm not that open. My hand comes to the floor and my my spine has to round sideways like a half moon. So this is not what we're really looking for in this pose. There are other poses where we actually want that feeling, but triangle isn't one of them. So I slide up as high as I need to to get that feeling of evenness in the sides of the waist and the sides of the chest. Again, working in front of a reflective surface like a mirror or a sliding glass door can be helpful in you visualizing your alignment. Very good thing to do when you're first learning these poses. I'm gonna come up and take it to the second side and talk a little bit more about the spine. So my hips have turned, I'm activating my legs. You can even imagine pulling on those jeans before you even tip into the pose. I'm gonna tip into the pose. My hand's gonna rest where it feels comfortable. And then I'm gonna energize the legs and check in with the length of the side of my waist and the side of my rib cage. Once I've got that clear, the next little factor is there's often a little turn of the chest a little bit more forward toward the long edge of your mat and possibly up towards the ceiling. The trick here is that as you turn your chest, the twist tends to wanna pull that upper hip up and back which can strain the inner groin of the front leg and jam the lower back on the back side. So I like to really keep those hips where they were and only turn the chest to the point where if I go any further, I'm gonna undo the the, the position that I put my hips in, okay? And then I'm gonna come up and out for a second. So when we talk about the arm position in triangle, when we enter and exit, the arms usually come out to the side parallel with the floor as I'm showing you here in mountain pose. So, That's all fine and well, except it doesn't always play out when we come into the full posture, especially if you're using propping. And so I like to think about the top edge of my shoulders as the alignment cue for my top arm. In other words, I don't wanna lift this arm up higher or lower, nor do I wanna bring it forward or back of that line. I really wanna draw an imaginary line right across the top of the shoulder. So that, for instance, if I was using a prop like a chair, If I knew that I was new in this pose and I couldn't tip down very far or I would start to round, I would bring myself up a little higher by using a chair, front foot out, back heel, everything's ready. I'm gonna inhale the arms up parallel with the floor. Now I'm gonna tip and I'm gonna bring my hand to the seat of the chair. So this is my stopping point when I'm using the chair. So if I just kept that top arm going, look at the relationship between the bottom arm and the top arm. They're actually not kind of one long line They're staggered, so I'm gonna take that top arm and I'm gonna even draw a line across the top of the chest and out into space. And then I'm set up very nicely with the top arm. The bottom shoulder blade, instead of sagging like this, engages onto the rib cage. So there's a sense of strength in this bottom shoulder blade area. To come up and out from here, I might micro bend the front knee. So I haven't talked much about exiting, but sometimes for some students, it's helpful to bend the knee a little bit as you come up. It releases some of the tension in the inner thigh and that'll feel a lot better, okay? So that's one possibility for the shoulders. Another possibility is is I'm a little more flexible. I can use a different prop that allows me to go down a little bit lower, but maybe not as low as one block height. So I'm gonna stack the blocks so they're a little higher and you can get really creative with your props. Feet even, front leg turns out, back heel kicks out a little bit. Energize the legs, the hips lift off, there's that slight turn to the pelvis, the chest turns back to center, I inhale my arms up, and now as I exhale, I shift my hips, I keep the side waist nice and even, and I find my prop. Now again, I could just touch the front chest with my finger and draw the line. Be mindful of this action here in which the arm goes way back. I know that there are some traditions in yoga that actually take triangle and they make it into a backbend, which is interesting, but I like to keep this more neutral because it's got great benefits just as it is. For instance, it lengthens the inner thigh muscles in the back hamstring of the front leg. It stretches the outer hip. It strengthens the side waist and the core in general. The bottom arm gets a little strengthening. 
The muscles around the joints activate throughout the legs, so the legs actually get stronger even as some muscle groups are stretching. And then the final piece of this, after I've kind of set my shoulders, is what do I want to do with my head? So I think that this is probably fairly aligned with the rest of my spine. In other words, my head and neck are in line with the rest of my spine. So this is my preferred position. Secondarily, I also sometimes turn to look down because for a lot of students, they'll get a lot of fatigue in the side of the neck. And when it gets really fatigued, then you get potential jamming in the vertebra of the cervical area. So turning the head down, even for a moment, and then turning back to the front position. And then really gradually over time, so that I don't throw my balance off, if I turn my head to look up, I really let my neck muscles give me some feedback on how far to go. Some traditions will have you throw the head back like this. I find that that's a little bit iffy for the, for the facet joints in the back of the neck. So look, looking straight up to the hand can be helpful. But then if the muscles fatigue, turn back to center or look down. And then to come out again, you can micro bend the front knee, inhale up and out, turn the feet even, bring the arms down and step the feet back to center. So as I've already alluded to and articulated a little bit, this uh, triangle pose is a great pose for building strength in your lower extremities. It also builds strength on the top waist, so when you do both sides, you end up getting a lot of strength in the side body. It's allowing the spine to be somewhat neutral, but also there's a little rotation that happens in the spine, so it's, in, it's uh, encouraging strong rotation in the spine. The bottom arm on the block can also get a little bit of activity in building strength. There's also an opportunity to create a nice wide openness at both the front chest and across the back of the chest. So it's not just a front body action, it's a back body action as well. Because of the sacroiliac joint and the lower back muscles and how they're positioned in triangle pose, I do usually give a little bit of a warning or a caution at least for those people who have lower back chronic pain or they have a sacroiliac joint, which is where the sacrum bone, which is this triangular bone here, and the pelvic bones meet in these little uh, diagonal lines. If that sacroiliac joint is sensitive, on one side they might be able to do triangle to a fuller degree, but on the other side where the SI joint is troubling, they might have to be a little more careful. So caution going in with low back pain, sacroiliac joint, and then all the stuff I just mentioned about the neck. I think you have to be very careful, especially if you're gonna do triangle pose as a static posture. And that simply means you get into the pose and you stay in it for a number of breaths. That if you're gonna be in there for a minute or two minutes, that you're mindful of how the neck feels and you give yourself the opportunity to move the neck around quite a bit. Finally, there's a couple of things you could do to get ready for, for triangle pose. One of my favorite ways to get ready for triangle pose is doing strap to foot pose. So you have a strap, you lie down on your back, you bring a knee into the chest, put the strap around the foot, take the leg up to the sky. Holding onto the strap with your arm onto the side, you bring your right leg out and over until your elbow comes down to the floor. You activate the legs, the hips have turned slightly towards the right leg, the back of the shoulder blades is even on the floor. So this is actually almost identical to the shape that we're in when we do triangle pose. So I can do it in a relaxed manner, which will stretch my inner thighs, or I can energize it a little bit more to bring a little more action into the body. And then of course I can come back up and I could repeat that on the second side with the left leg. So there are lots of ways to get ready for triangle. Um, it's often a good idea after you do triangle pose to consider doing some sort of a symmetric posture, like standing forward bend is a classic one that's often recommended in some traditions, and I think it's not a bad idea. Something like downward dog, or even just a simple standing forward fold where you come into Uttanasana, so that you take that asymmetric position that you just did in triangle and you bring it back into a symmetric relationship so that the joints of the back and the spine have a moment to neutralize or come back into their more common position. Because I don't know about you, but I don't, I've, I don't know of anybody who has a job actually in which they're in triangle all day long. So it's a great posture to let our body explore its full potential, but at the same time, we wanna come back into that place of balance and evenness. So with those thoughts on triangle pose, uh, play around with some of the ideas using chairs and blocks, using ways to warm up the body to get ready for the pose, and uh, try to find all the fruits that Utita Trikonasana has for you. Thanks very much. Namaste.